This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 96, recorded on August 17th, 2010. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, and today we're continuing with Virology 101. And with me to do that, right across the desk, is Dixon de Palmier. Hey, Vince. How are you doing, Dixon? Doing well. I always say that. Well, I yeah. am. Very good. I well, would good. let you know if I wasn't. These are the episodes you like particularly. I love these because I get to play the role of the real dummy in this case. and <laughs> The uninitiated non-virologist gets to ask all the right, right questions yeah. from an innocent standpoint. Vincent is George and you're Gracie. <laughs> hey, was, whose voice was so that? I, I, somebody, ah, wait a minute. That was from North Central Florida. That's Rich Condit. Welcome, Rich. Hi, fellas. Hey, this is your first, your first Virology 101. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm really looking forward to this. Good. Um, this will be a good time. Rich is here because, well, actually, he's joined TWIV since the last Virology 101. Exactly. And he is a DNA guy. Cool. And that is the topic for today. DNA viruses. How viruses with DNA genomes duplicate their genetic information. Huh. It's not as simple as you might think. I've never thought that was simple, ever. Now, the <laughs> Remember, last... I went to school before they knew DNA was the actual genetic material. <laughs> Ooh, yes, it's in true. Fact, in fact, I was just going to say, we've done a Virology 101 on RNA synthesis and reverse transcription, and you should go back to those, the listeners, that is, because we talk all about the history of the discovery of nucleic acids, exactly. RNA and DNA, yep. which we don't want to go through again. Nope. Now, we have talked about how viruses with RNA genomes duplicate their genetic information. Right. All of those viruses have to have an enzyme called RNA polymerase that they bring into the cell or encode in their genome because a cell can't copy big RNAs that those viruses have. Right. Okay. Today, the viruses we're going to talk about have DNA, like us. Wow. We have DNA as our genetic material. Huh. And these viruses, many of them tap into our machinery. So you think some of them might have come from us, Vince? Or do you mm. think we derived ourselves Is from that them? Is that the chicken or the egg? It's a philosoph philosophical question that's unanswerable, <laughs> I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> at least I can ask it now, but, but before I couldn't. <laughs> you can. We don't know. Who knows? There's some theories that say viruses came from cells or... Right. I mean, we've been down that road before, first. but now we we've know. got the DNA instead yeah. of just the RNA, right? It's Well, you, at, maybe at the end you'll have some insight, because, and, and you'll have as much as anyone. Right. Because we just don't know. Right. So today we will talk about how viruses with DNA genomes duplicate that material. So what we have today is we have slides, ah. pictures, and words. Excellent. And uh, at some point this will be released as a video, nice. so you can see that and when the audio comes out which hopefully will be soon we'll also provide all the slides so in case we don't have the video right away hmm. as the video takes a while to put together right so uh, and there in this video you can see rich condit so uh, no one has really seen him before <laughs> so there he is and I'm, on the wall behind him are all his kids Great. it's pretty yep. cool very nice. That's really neat. And there's Dixon. You see the camera over there, Dixon? I do see that. That's camera. Dixon across the desk. This is typically how we sit, unless I'm mad at you and then I have my back to you. That's right. right. Exactly. And we never see Rich, but in the future, we'd like to do this more. Sure. So Rich is going to go away now, and so are we, because we're going to go to the slides. Right. Or as they used to say, let's go to the videotape. I don't Got know. It. That's probably older than Warner or. Wolf used to say that. He did? He did. So we'll do this, and if we have time, we'll do some email. Great. Let's start at the beginning. Now, huh. let's see. How do I get rid of Rich Con? <laughs> just, just do slideshow. It's easy. Just tell me to go away. I'm, I'm out of here. There he oh, is. Oh, no, no. He's there. He's gone. Please. Oh, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> so, Rich, I'm on the first slide, which is a... Uh, I'm on the first slide, too. Picture oh, double of, helix. Picture of a double-stranded DNA molecule, which everyone probably recognizes. Even little kids. Dixon, who solved that structure? Well, you know, it's it's up for grabs on that one. I think Rosalind Franklin had something to do with it. But I'm glad you said that. Because Watson and Crick are given full credit for it. But they, they through their biographies, admitted that uh, Rosalind played a huge role in all of this just by yes. providing them with insight as to what well, they, this thing looked she like. She had the, the pictures, the x-ray pictures. Looking right down the core of this thing, yes. they could 
They could see it, but Linus Pauling... Well, we won't go there. And then there was another scientist who actually used to be here at Columbia who played an important role. That's his role. Erwin Chargaff. Exactly. Hey, hey. He had exactly. the base pairs all worked out, but he, he did. didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what it meant structurally, but they used that in right. solving the structure. Right. So here on our screen is a short piece of double-stranded DNA. Now, there are, we take lots of liberties when we talk about this, yeah. and we have to really explain them clearly. It's double-stranded, first of all. So... Let's talk about how this this DNA is made up. So you, I think you can see one strand, the backbone of one strand, curving around in a helical form, and then the second strand. It's pretty obvious. Yep. And it, it, we'll see in a moment in a bit more detail. That backbone is made up of sugars and phosphates. And then what holds the two strands together are the bases. Right. They hydrogen bond with one another. Correct. And do you know how to break those bonds, Dixon? I guess it has to end in ace. <laughs> These, no, the bonds between the bases. You could cut it. Yes, you could cut this into short pieces you with DNA. You can say which particular yeah, way okay. this is going. I'm, I'm wrong. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can pull the two strands apart with heat. If you can put them together with a polymerase, I bet you you can take them apart with yeah. a depolymerase. There are, there are enzymes that pull them apart as well. And as right. you'll see, some of the polymerases do a good job of doing right. or, that. Or you could just heat it up. Yes, yeah, so you could he definitely heat it up. Of course, in our cell, you would have to get very hot to separate these strands, and we don't typically do that. But what an interesting question. Why don't the bacteria who live at the bottom of the ocean, where it's hundreds of degrees, why doesn't their DNA melt? Hmm. This is good trust. Anyway, that's a diversion. Melt. You said melt. So that's the w one of the words we use. When we separate the strands by heating, we call it melting. Indeed. So it's double-stranded. And if you took away one strand, you could replace it because all the information to make that second strand is in the first, and vice versa. And vice versa. Right? Like, so the uh, two Velcro. strands. It's like Velcro. We I call one Velcro. strand and the other is the complement. Right. Now, that may not be so clear, but maybe in the next slide it will be. Let's see what we have here. Ah. ah. Rich, did you want to add anything to that first nope, slide? No, that's okay. I'm waiting for the base pairs here. They're my favorite. <laughs> you like the base pairs? Yeah, when uh, when uh, when I was in this is a digression, but when I was in graduate school, my uh, my boss came back from giving a qualifying exam to some student, and she was uh, she was all miffed because the student didn't even know the structure of the bases, and I'm yep. sitting there thinking, oh, "Ooh, I don't know the structure of the bases." <laughs> so right. I I I tried to write off and memorize them, and in fact, the way I one of the tricks I used to memorize them was to memorize them as base pairs. Indeed. Okay, because uh, they make more sense as base pairs, uh, or it's easier to remember them. Many more. qualifying exams have gone by this. I remember when I was a postdoc with David Baltimore, he came back from an exam complaining that the student didn't know the structure, the chemical structures of the four bases, uh. adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. That's right. So this is a different view of the DNA molecule we just showed. It's uh, a chemical structural view. Yep. You can see the two strands, again... One strand, the backbone of phosphates and sugars, mm -hmm. and the other on the other side. And then in the middle, the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonding between the bases. And yes, it was Erwin Chargaff who said right. the amount of adenine is always equal to the amount of thymine in DNA, and the same as it's guanine. A mystery. It's a he they, didn't know why. And what, a, what an interesting observation, and what a poser, unless you know the structure. That's right. I mean, could you imagine learning that? That yeah. takes a pure chemist to do that, first correct. of all. Right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It's not correct. something that I would ever have discovered. And when <laughs> Pauling came up with his proposed structure, he yeah. had three phosphates in the center, and everything else was ah. on the outside. Interesting. And it's just Even that. convincing yourself that they were really equal to each other, you know, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, there had to be a reason for that, correct. right? Correct. Now, let's see. There are a couple of interesting things. So, first of all, this I think you can see how it makes a double strand. And if you heat this... You can separate one strand from the other. And again, right. a strand is a backbone with bases attached. So let's look at the backbone. So we have at the very top left, five prime end, there's a phosphate group, and then a sugar. It's a ribose because it has five carbons. Yes. And then uh, down another phosphate, another sugar, another phosphate, another sugar, and so on down the line. That's the backbone of DNA. In the other view, this was twisted into a helix, and here it's been flattened down. Right. So if you melt it, and then you cool it. What is the process called where it comes back together again? That re re annealing. Annealing. Yes. Annealing. Or re annealing. Yes. What's a mystery to me? I mean, I'm just fascinated by nature anyway. And I'm sure you are too, Richard. When we first learned about this, 
how does a molecule through just stoichiometric chemistry align itself perfectly? And yet it does. It finds exactly the, the fit. It's like Cinderella and that magic slipper. I mean, here's does, the one yeah. strand and here's another strand way over here someplace. And then you just take away the heat and eventually they keep making Well, in fact, you have to do amazing. it at the right you have to do it at the right temperature that re re retains a lot of molecular motion. Sure. Uh, sure. The, so that the two halves have an opportunity to to check each other out a lot until uh, at random the right fit is is found where there's exactly. a sequence. I don't know how many bases it takes to nucleate this, but but once it's done, boom, the it's whole It's like thing a zipper. Is. That's right. that's yep. exactly right. I'm just that's that's a good point. It, it is amazing. I'm fascinated by the In whole fact, deal. In fact, people have analyzed this mathematically for yes. many years. Yes, it's yes. a very interesting e equation that des that describes this. All right, there are two things I want to mention. First of all, we we will talk throughout today about directionality of DNA replication. We'll always talk about five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime. Uh -huh. And why? what is this 5' prime and 3' prime business? Okay, so you can see on the upper left of this molecule here, it says 5' prime end. What is that? Well, all that refers to is the carbon. So if we look at right. one of these sugar molecules on the upper right, this is a ribose, which is one of the backbone components. It has how many carbons? One, two, three. Uh, the fourth carbon is not labeled, and then a fifth carbon. Right. And they're called primes. I don't know why they're primes. Anyone know? Uh, because the bases get real numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. Uh -huh. And to distinguish between that numbering and the numbering <laughs> on the sugars, they gave primes to the guys on the sugars. Beautiful. Was that on your uh, prelims also? I <laughs> just made that up. <laughs> I, but, <laughs> but it's got to be true. It has to be true. That's be. true. That has to be true. So the result is the five prime end of this sugar defines the end of the whole DNA. Cool. It's the five prime carbon to which that, that phosphate is and attached. And I'll bet you at the other end of this whole thing... <laughs> it's the three prime it's end. It's the three prime end, that's yes, right. Yes, you can see the three prime end has a hydroxyl which is connected to this three prime carbon. It can't here. be a five prime end at the other end either because it's occupied by another molecule, correct? Well, it is. It's linked to the phosphate here to that's another right. sugar. There's exactly. not a free five prime so there's end. No, yeah. it's, so it has to be a three prime or it could be a two. Why isn't it a two prime? That would be this one here. Yeah. The two prime just has Steric. a hydroxyl. It doesn't form the, a bond with the next uh, phosphate. Right. It's not involved in the bonding anyway. Right. Well, and they focus on the five prime and the three prime ends because that's where uh, the phosphate uh, bridge right. sure. connects. Right. Okay? And it's where the enzymes between the pick three up prime the, story, the five right? prime carbon. So yeah, I, I, the active sites of the enzymes pick up those stories. Exactly. Exactly. So here, from for example, on the upper left here, we have a phosphate. Linkage, which joins the three prime end of this sugar, the first sugar, to right. the it's five prime. Three end to of the five, second. three to five, three to five. So on five. one strand, the bases, the sugars, the phosphate sugars go five to three prime. On the other, it goes in the opposite direction, five. five prime to three prime. So remember, if one strand is going five prime to three prime, the other is right. going in the opposite direction. Now there's names for the strands too, isn't there? Or aren't there? Sam, <laughs> Lydia. Uh, my no, boss no, no. used to call him Watson and Crick. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, so actually, one thing we haven't mentioned is that this contains the information to make life. Exactly. And things that are not living, like viruses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so one strand is the sense. And the anti uh, yeah, The, the anti-sense, yes. sure. So this, the, sequence the, of, I used this, to say. the sequence of these bases, right, yeah. encodes the protein. It does. In triplets of three. So this is an informational molecule with just four different bases. You can well, make all of these actually proteins. Actually, they encode the RNA, don't they, Vince? So the DNA is copied to RNA. Right, which then in triplets. So the anti-sense strand is copied to form the mRNA, which is the sense polarity. Right. And then the mRNA is translated to protein. And the other strand is used to replicate itself. Did I say translated to mRNA? <laughs> uh, I don't know. That went by me. Uh, but if you did, you can excuse yeah, yourself. it's transcribed. <laughs> It's, we know that copying, making a piece of RNA from DNA is transcription. Right. So, so you can really look at the chemistry of this and impress your friends. I remember, I remember <laughs> understanding that this was a five prime to three prime phosphodiester bond, and thinking, "Holy cow! I really understand what that means. Bingo. Five prime, three prime. There's a phosphate, and the uh, oxygen linkages are ester linkages. Five right. prime, three prime phosphodiester bond." 
Big words. Yep. Cool. They all make sense. Yep. Now, another cool thing. So you can see here, this is an informational molecule, and both strands have information. Uh, and the other cool thing here is you can see between the bases, some of them have two hydrogen bonds and others have three. Right. So the AT pair has only two. So that must mean they're tougher to break. Yeah. So the GC, the guanine cytosine pairs, are harder to break. So DNA with a lot of GC is harder to melt or denature. Uh -huh. Notice that there are also two fundamentally different uh, chemistries to the bases. There are small guys, yeah, yeah. thymine and cytidine, that have a single ring. Those are called pyrimidines. And there are larger guys, adenine and guanine, that have two rings. Those are called purines. I remember that because the shorter name is the bigger molecule. Very good. <laughs> right? That's a good word. Um, and uh, uh, the way the base pairs are worked, there's always a purine base paired with a pyrimidine, and that maintains the the distance appropriately. Of That's course. right. If you try and stick uh, two uh, pyrimidines in there, they're too small, two purines are too big. Right. Now, the you can imagine that discovering this structure was huge. Yeah, indeed. Right? Indeed. It let us know immediately how DNA could be replicated. That's correct. That it is. let us know all about the genetic code. Yep. Um, and everything, really, that we know today about molecular biology comes from that discovery. So what did... In 1953, Dixon... The structure of DNA was determined, and that was the year I was born. Published in Nature. Is that the right? I was, is that the I right was year? five years old. Yeah. I Where was. were you, Dixon? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> he, was, he was a bit older. All right. You yeah. arrogant youngsters. <laughs> now, here's a nice picture showing very overview of how this molecule can be duplicated. Yeah, I wanted to add a note of history of here, course, too, though. Of course, do. A woman who knew Rosalind Franklin was on our, our faculty here. Her name was Barbara Lowe. You might have known her, Vince. She was an X-ray crystallographer that studied with mm -hmm. uh, Maurice Perutz in the same laboratory that Rosalind Franklin was in. And she had some heart-wrenching stories to tell about Rosalind. And Rosalind Franklin died an early death, mm -hmm. from overexposure to x-rays, which was her instrument of choice to study yeah, the sure. structure of molecules. And what well, a sad death. And that's why she couldn't get the Nobel that's Prize. Right. Well, they don't, I don't give know it to if, more than three. Well, Watson and Crick. And? Did Perutz get it as well? Uh, Maurice Wilkins. Maurice Wilkins. Wilkins. That's right. Wilkins got it too. Are we correct on this or should we look it up? No, I think it's. I think you're right about Wilkins. Uh, I'll look it up. You guys wrap. So there are already three. Okay. But they gave it to Perutz also for his uh, study of hemoglobin or myoglobin rather. And yeah, that was another prize. And she right. never actually figured into it in any way. And that's no. too bad. Well, the problem. It, it, she died, and therefore she wasn't a voice in her own defense. Well, you can't give a Nobel Prize to a dead person. That's another rule. Is that still yeah. Watson, uh, Watson, yeah. Crick, and Wilkins? That's okay, right. Maurice that's Wilkins. Right. That's right. All right, so that you get, to take DNA and make more of it, it's really simple. For a double-stranded DNA, you take apart the strands and you fill in what's missing. And exactly. all the information to do that is there. There you, you just, go. You just put the right base in. So here we have a double-stranded DNA, which at the top of the picture is double-stranded, and then it's been pulled apart, and then we can copy in the second strand. So now we have two strands where there was one. So Vince, does the same enzyme copy both strands or do you have two different sites of enzymes, one for each strand? It's very complicated. <laughs> the, there are, as you will see, there is one or there are a couple of enzymes involved um, that do different things. But the one that polymerizes uh, is the same enzyme. That's doing both strands. Yes. Interesting. And, the, you know, how that happens is still really not known. The topology of the complex yeah. isn't really clear. And as we talk about what has to go on here, you will see that uh, it's it involves some things that we don't know. And it's amazing how few mistakes it makes in doing so. DNA replication is quite faithful, especially compared to RNA replication. Orders That's, of magnitude more faithful. Yeah, because it's yeah. more important to get the, uh, the <laughs> I don't know about the that. blueprints correct they, than there it is are, to get the house straight. There <laughs> are mechanisms to proofread this. Yes. But there aren't any for RNA viruses. Editing. You know, they're pluses they just and minus. produce lots of it in hopes that some of it succeeds. And it yeah, they have huge numbers of progeny. Right. Now the you know, mammals and other DNA based organisms, their reproductive rates are not so high, so they have to get it right. RNA viruses, they make billions and billions of offspring. And if one is right, that's all you need, right? That's right. I mean, we talked about an organism yesterday on another TWIP uh, for the Setsi fly. 
Mm. And it replicates one organism of its own kind per, like, week. It lays one right. egg per week. That's not bad compared uh, to an elephant. <laughs> but compared to most flies that lay hundreds to thousands of eggs at one sitting, this is a remarkable organism. It is. This will actually be the topic of an evolution Virology 101, which will probably happen right. in five years <laughs> at the rate that we're going. If we're still here. All right. So I want to just read a sentence from the Watson yeah. and Crick paper. Uh -huh. uh, it's the last sentence in the oh, paper. Yes. Oh, yes. They don't, it says, uh, well, it's the second to last. Uh, it's yeah. near the end of the paper. It says, it has not escaped our notice <laughs> yes. that the specific pairing mechanism we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Right. I mean, that's the biggest understatement yeah, in the right. history of biological exactly science. Exactly right. And Terrific. they knew it. And yep. they knew it. Yeah. yeah. And they knew it. It's good. All right. one, of those, one of those guys is still alive. Yeah, Crick is still alive. Watson. Oh, Watson. Sorry, Watson's alive. Watson's. Crick died not too long ago. Right. And we don't hear much about Maurice Wilkins. Ever. All right, uh, Rich, I'm going to go to a slide now called DNA replication. Got it. You're with me? Yeah. A couple of things we need to point out. And since I'm getting old, I can't remember them, so I <laughs> have to write them down. So this is obvious. Viruses must replicate their genomes to make new progeny. I think, Dixon, you can see that. Uh, you know, Vince, that's sort of true for everything. Yeah, because every virus needs to have a genome. So if a virus particle goes in a cell, wants to make more, it's got to make more genomes. Same that goes for both all viruses. And oak trees and whales. and Even trypanosomes. Even <laughs> trypanosomes, that's right. Now, here's the cool, the cool part. Making more genomes for all the DNA viruses always requires the, the production of at least one virus protein. So the simplest examples we'll talk about today, the viruses, just make one protein that participates in viral DNA synthesis. Other viruses, like the ones that Rich work on, make tons, <laughs> tons right. of protein. And here, the last part of this sentence, hence... Always delayed after infection. DNA replication is always delayed because you have to make this, this protein before DNA replication can occur. So even the smallest DNA virus, it's got to get in the cell. The DNA that gets in has to be converted to mRNA. Right. The mRNA has to be translated into the protein that the virus needs in order to undergo DNA replication. And that takes time. You have to have enough of that protein. You might ask why the virus has to make a protein because, you know, all the proteins are there, are there in the cell. And I always think of this as uh, the virus minimally encodes one protein to basically redirect the attention of the cell to the virus DNA molecule and make that the preferred molecule for replication. Yeah, and we'll see some examples of this one protein. It's amazing. Vir the way I look at it is viruses have to solve a number of problems that we'll get to in, in copying their DNA. And to do that, they need to have at least one protein. So we'll see what these are. What's next? DNA is always made in a five-prime to three-prime direction. Basic chemistry. You have to remember that. The template is copied in a three- to five-prime direction, but the new product is always synthesized in a five to three prime direction okay if you can remember that a lot becomes easier here's another interesting point dna synthesis always starts at what we call an origin of replication or ori a defined place it doesn't just start anywhere and it must have a primer <laughs> now rna synthesis RNA-dependent RNA synthesis, which we talked about, sometimes requires a primer, sometimes it doesn't. But DNA synthesis always requires some sort of primer, and we'll talk about that. So remember Ori. You remember Ori? I do. He, I knew him well. <laughs> His uh, cousin, Oreo, I knew very well as a kid. <laughs> the host provides other proteins. For most of the viruses we'll talk about. See, that's the mystery of all of this to a non-virologist. Yes. Is that this safe cracker sort of walks in <laughs> and says, I can use everything in front of me to build a brand new house. I can, I can build my house out of the stuff that's here. I find everything I need. All I need to do is tell them what kind of house. And it's, there, it's the virus's house, not yours. 
but yes. it uses all of the parts. Yes. It disassembles it you and puts it back together as the virus. But what we will see wow. is that some viruses, the simpler DNA viruses, use a lot of the parts from the host to replicate their genomes. And as we get bigger and bigger, they use less and less. But they still need something from the host. Right. Okay. Here are the steps that we're going to talk about in DNA replication. So you recognize that something... Yes, Dixon has to explode. Excuse me. <laughs> what if we were live, Dixon? That would be a viral cough. Um, yeah, just lower the mic a bit. There you go. Okay, here we go. Can we hear you? Sure. I'll put it back where it was because right. I don't want to change the levels halfway through. Thank here you very we go. much. Let's say this origin of replication where DNA synthesis begins has to be recognized. DNA synthesis has to be primed. Then you elongate, that means making the new DNA. And then finally you have so to you stop. Need building materials. You need building materials, the bases. Right. And then You need a building site, you need plans, you need building materials, and then you have to know when you're finished. Exactly. It's like a house. And then bases and phosphates and riboses. You have to stop. And we call that termination. We give it a fancy word, but it just means stopping. And it usually is because it ran out of building material or what? Yeah, oh. some signal or you run out of template or, okay. you know, there'll yeah. be a defined end. We'll run into several of those. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, we will. You'll see. Okay, next slide is, this is, I'm going to give to Rich because I think he likes this. <laughs> I love this. It's, it's called the five prime <laughs> Rich end. Rich doesn't like it. He loves it. <laughs> the five prime end problem. He actually made this slide. I think it's really nice. All right. So I think that this is not only interesting, but uh, central to having an appropriate perspective on why viruses uh, replicate DNA or have genomes that have certain uh, conformations, replicated in certain ways or have certain conformations. So as Vincent said, you need primers uh, to extend, uh, to initiate DNA synthesis. Right. Uh, and he also said that the DNA polymerase, basically what that means is that DNA polymerase can't just sit down on a DNA template and start making DNA. What it needs is a free three prime hydroxyl group mm -hmm. on the end of an oligonucleotide that is already base paired to the DNA. Right. And it can then attach to the DNA, uh, uh, grabbing onto both the template uh, and to the growing strand with a three prime end positioned in the active side of the enzyme and it can use that three prime end and polymerize onto that it just can't start by itself it needs a pre-existing three prime end mm -hmm. vincent also said that rna polymerases can do this so there are enzymes in uh, used in dna replication well actually different sorts of priming mechanisms are used as we will discuss but uh typically in cellular dna synthesis for example and in many other uh, organisms uh, what's used as a primer is RNA because, as Vincent said, RNA polymerases can, in fact, initiate uh, synthesis of DNA, of RNA, from a template de novo. And there's a special class of these that are used in DNA replication called uh, primases that attach to various places, sometimes specific on DNA, and lay down RNA primers. So in this top diagram, what's shown is a template strand. Notice that the three prime end is on the left and the five prime end is on the right because we usually uh, picture uh, synthesis going from left to right, from five prime to three prime, and there is an anti-parallel structure. Also, we usually to uh, indicate another indication of the polarity is we use an arrowhead at the three prime end. Right. Okay, so what's shown here is the green primers have been laid down by a primase or something on a blue DNA template. Next thing that happens is the DNA polymerase attaches and it can attach at ev everywhere there's a three prime end, which would be an arrowhead on each of the RNA primers. And it elongates, so the red that it's put in there is DNA, five prime to three prime direction. Next thing that typically happens, and I've uh, simplified this by putting them all together, is that the RNA primers are excised by usually an enzyme called ribonuclease H, H for hybrid, that takes an RNA-DNA hybrid and chews up the RNA, which would leave you uh, with that same middle molecule without any of the green. And then, since there are now three prime ends on the DNA that's just been synthesized, the polymerase can now continue on those three prime ends and fill in the gaps where the primers were. Okay? Then you're left with a little gap 
So that was elongation. You're left with a little gap, and there's a special enzyme called ligase that comes in and seals the gap to generate the molecule that's down on the bottom. But you're left with a problem. That is, you've excised a primer from the five prime end, and you've got a gap there where the primer was. Right. Now what are you going to do? Well, I mean, maybe you put in another primer or elongate, but you've got to take the primer out, okay? You're always left with a gap. There's no way to fill the gaps on the ends of a linear DNA molecule. And so a lot of the mechanisms that we see, uh, I, you know, I've thought a lot about this, and I think somebody goofed. <laughs> right, <laughs> and, we, That's and we've been law. some engineer there blew it a long time ago, That's right. and we've been paying for it ever since. Right? Either that, or there's something fundamental that I just don't understand, and certainly not my friends understand. At any rate, we're left with this problem, and a lot of the mechanisms of viral DNA replication that you will see are ways of getting around this problem. Leave the mystery there, and we'll uh, revisit this problem as we go through the molecules. Now, that particular problem, how is that solved in, a, in, in our cells? Telomeres. That's right. Uh -huh. Telomeres, which was, were, whose discovery received a Nobel Prize just last year, if you remember. That's true. Well, those we, are specialized structures yeah. that are polymerized onto the end, as I recall, in a, an, an RNA-templated fashion. Right. Right. Yeah, so the ends are highly repeated, right? And you actually and lose sequence at every you do. division at That's every true. synthesis, and and then you die, and you die when you lose when you lose sure. it all. Except if you have an enzyme activated that restores the ends, That's called right. telomerase, then you have cancer. <laughs> to put it simply or over simply, maybe. So you got your choice: cancer or death. Mm. Yeah. Now, viruses, as, as Rich said, solve this in very interesting ways. I'm sure. And that's why probably that's one of the reasons they all have to make at least one protein. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, we, let's move on. And all of the mechanisms we're going to talk about today, all the viruses, there's two basic ways to duplicate DNA. Uh -huh. So here we have two different mechanisms. And in each case, there's double-stranded DNA we have two strands. One is dark blue and one is light blue. And on the left, we have a bunch of viruses, papillomaviruses, HPV, right? right? Polyomaviruses, where Rich got his start in virology. True. Is that right? Herpes yeah, well, phage. I started with phage, but we'll go with polyomas. It's pretty since early, we're, pretty we're, early you, on. We're eukaryotic today. <laughs> right. Herpes viruses and retroviruses proviruses when they're part of the genome, they all replicate this way by what's called a replication fork. Right. The DNA strands are separated, and replication is going on on both strands. And as you can see here, what we've got are green primers, which Rich just told us about, mm -hmm. and then followed by synthesis of DNA in either in red or pink to show the two polarities. And the synthesis is happening on both strands of DNA. Different directions, remember, because the strands are anti-parallel, right? Five to three and three to five, the this, this synthesis is happening in different directions. That's called a replication fork uh, because the molecule, it looks like a fork, right? And the molecules are both being replicated, both strands. Now on the right is the second mechanism. It's called strand displacement. And this happens for adenoviruses, parvoviruses, and poxviruses. Uh -huh. Again, it's primer-dependent DNA synthesis, but what you have here, the primer is laid down, and then the red is DNA synthesis on one strand, and the other strand is displaced. You don't have synthesis on that second strand. It may happen later separately, but it doesn't happen at the same time as in a replication fork, so it's a distinct mechanism. If, if you did that, by the way, would that not then zip back together again? Then you'd have four strands, and that would create replication problems. That's an interesting question. And some viruses make proteins that bind to this single strand and keep it single-stranded. So that, that you don't get into those problems. Yeah. So with, right. with simultaneous replication, there isn't that yeah, problem. But both, with only yeah. one strand, you might have that problem arise, right? Exactly. Okay. And we'll see some examples of that. Interesting. Okay? And, and yet there's another enzyme over here causing this to come apart. Is that correct? I, my feeling is it's the polymerase complex that's denaturing. There are enzymes that are part of that, that that will melt the duplex. Well, and the proteins that you've talked about, you know, once you uh, 
bind up that single strand that's being displaced. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that probably helps the displacement mechanism as well. But there are also we got, uh, we got helicases. Yes, uh, that's it. Thing. There are heli. That's what I was going to say. There are helicases that are involved in melting this as well. Okay. Right. Okay, Rich. Yep. All right. Now, these um, viruses need to use DNA polymerase, among other things, to replicate the DNA. Where does it come from? Hmm. Well, the small DNA viruses, small meaning with small genomes, they don't encode everything they need to replicate their genomes. The papillomaviruses, the polyomaviruses, the parvoviruses, these are all DNA viruses with relatively small genomes. They do not encode DNA polymerase. They use the host's enzyme. Bingo. Okay. They, these viruses do encode proteins that orchestrate the host. I like that word. Um, and we'll see there's a minimum of one for every virus, every DNA virus we know of. But they basically use host systems. Their, their genomes are too small. They couldn't encode everything they needed anyway. Now, as we get into the viruses with larger DNA genomes, like herpes viruses, adenoviruses, and pox viruses, they begin to encode more and more of the DNA replication system until we get to pox viruses, which, am I correct in saying, Rich, they basically encode their own DNA replication system? Uh, yeah, they do. Uh, well, there's a little bit of borrowing now and then from the host, but they're, hmm. they are capable of doing the whole thing on their own. Right. It's amazing. Now, herpes can do a lot, but they still need something from the host as well as add. But pox, probably among all of these, may be the most minimal host the most, Yeah, I think that's that, that's a fair statement. And maybe memes are similar to that, but no one's looked at them that way Don't yet. know yet. Yeah. yeah. So this is an interesting distinction. As you get bigger and bigger DNA genomes, you get less and less dependent on the host. Now, in, in my limited knowledge of molecular biology, and although I claimed to have been a molecular parasitologist, we didn't get as deeply into this as uh, the virologists do, although we could. How many kinds of pol DNA polymerases are there? I recall that there are at least three. But yeah, there are multiple. and I. So which one does like, the virus use? All of them. All of them. All of them, man. I see. I, I could tell you the names of them if you'd like, but there are multiple. There are uh, here we go. Aha. Uh -huh. We have... Um, I mean, these are host enzymes now. Yeah, there are, there are multiple polymerases. Do you know how many polymerases there are offhand? You're talking Which, to me? Yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> Jeez. Uh, what comes to mind is three. Three. three that's yeah, the one I have. Alpha, three. beta, and gamma. One of which is mitochondrial. Is that right? Ah. Uh -huh. This is not something I think about every day. Yeah, and then there's the primase, which makes the primers. Uh -huh. And then there are a variety of other proteins that are involved in this. The I'm ligase, sure. the RNSH. Modifying uh, proteins. There are clamps that slide along the DNA. and help. It's, uh, it's just amazing. We don't want to actually get into it in that deeply, but it's quite complex. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, I want to say, too, that uh, our approach here in this Virology 101 is pretty anthropocentric. We're <laughs> focusing on um, right. mammalian viruses that uh, you know have been sort of the prominent families that uh, are associated usually with disease in humans of yes. one sort or another, which is why we know about them. But there are uh, obviously bacteriophages and plant viruses as well. I'm not as familiar with them in terms of uh, this particular distinction. I do know of a number of bacteriophages that, uh, matter of fact, all of the DNA bacteriophages that I can think of encode their own DNA polymerases. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Um, and the plant viruses, I'm not so sure. We'll get somebody to uh, call in on that. Some of them are really small. The circoviruses are mm -hmm. really small. So it wouldn't surprise me to uh, learn that the, uh, uh, some of the plant viruses used a host DNA polymerase. I'm glad you brought that up because we are anthropocentric here. And the book that I wrote, co-authored is all about... Viruses. viruses that infect humans. That infect yeah. humans. So, I mean, I think that's okay. We can be anthropocentric, but we ought to acknowledge the fact yes. that the field is broader than that. Now, Absolutely. we will we'll get somebody on that can talk about phage and plant viral DNA replication at some point. Absolutely. I'm sure they would love to join us. Yep. All right, viral proteins that we need. We've talked about the DNA polymerase and other proteins from the cell. Um, you need proteins that bind the ori. Viruses make those. You need helicases to unwind. You need exonucleases to chop away stuff that may be wrong. 
And then a bunch of enzymes involved in nucleic acid metabolism that are involved in producing triphosphates and modifying them and so forth. So there are lots of proteins involved. And we're simplifying this greatly, but we want to give an overview. So, Vince, are there any latent DNA viruses that come into the cell and integrate their DNA into the host and just stay there for a while? Oh, this is fabulous. What we are talking about today are viruses that go in and make a ton of DNA, make a ton of particles, and then leave. But you're right. That's not the only outcome. Okay. Some of them go in and become latent and don't really replicate all that much. They just sit there as stealth yeah, viruses. absolutely. And, you know, we're not going to talk about that. But when we do talk about latency, you know, the herpes viruses do that. Uh, other viruses, they will enter the cell. They can integrate. They exist as an episome and low copy number. Right. And the, regulate, the regulatory networks that control which way you go are very interesting. Amazing. But I'm glad you brought that up because it's been bugging me that we couldn't get into it today. Mm -hmm. And now, well, there you are. We've mentioned Well, but I just was thinking back to our earlier discussions about all the other parts of the DNA molecule that don't encode genes that we need for our own daily lives, but we may be remnants of other viral infections that we've had in the past. Maybe some of these uh, DNA viruses contributed to that as well. Why not? I don't Could know. be. Okay. All right. Viral origins. That's where DNA synthesis begins. Right, Dick? Right. Ori. Ori. These are typically rich in AT. Oh. All right. Okay. The two bases AT. Okay. They're recognized by viral proteins. Some viral d genomes have one Ori, and others have multiple ones. And sometimes they have different purposes. For example, the herpes viruses huh. have different Ori's for lytic and latent replication. Oh, look at that. Very complicated. All right, what do we need to copy DNA? Here is a really key point that I like to emphasize because we'll get back to this when we talk about transformation and tumorigenesis or oncogenesis. For the most part, viruses don't like to replicate in a quiescent cell. That is a cell that's not dividing. You know, many of our cells aren't dividing at any given time. Exactly. So a virus may infect us and find, mm, this cell is not dividing. Why is that bad? For who? Us or them? <laughs> <laughs> for the virus, for the virus. Uh, because I guess maybe there's not a lot of the materials that they need in order to replicate themselves. It's not being made in excess because the cell itself is not replicating. So yes, all of those building blocks are not there. The building blocks, but specifically... Because they're brought in by active transport What do these usually. viruses need in, in reference to today's discussion in particular? They need a DNA polymerase and all the machinery. And if the cell's not dividing, most of that is off. So this, off or degraded, you mean, so they make it again when they need well, it? Well, the cells aren't actively replicating their DNA. So, so they don't store these things someplace. Uh, you know, and just that's draw a good question. I don't know how it's regulated, but when the cell is not actively replicating its genome, the viruses that depend on the cell don't get replicated right. either. So what happens? Many viruses get in a cell and they kick it. They kick the cell and they say, hey, wake up, make some DNA. Yeah. Uh, they encode proteins that push the cell to DNA synthesis. I'll be darned. Very important. Do these somehow interact with the phosphorylation cascade that leads into the nucleus that tells it to start dividing? Oh, they're incredible cascades that they interact with. There are many, many regulatory limits on cell, cell cycling. Right. And the, vir the viral proteins tap into that, which we will talk about in a future Terrific. Virology Terrific. 101. Terrific. So these viral proteins activate the cellular DNA synthesis machinery for their own good. You'd call that mutagenesis at this point? Not at this point, but when you keep replicating uncontrollably, yeah. Yeah. eventually you accumulate yeah. mutations. Right. Yes. This is a very important uh, step in our understanding of cancer, actually. All right, Dick, I'm on a slide called Requirements for DNA Replication. Rich. I'm here. Not, yep. uh, no, I said yep. Dick. You did, and I meant Rich. Well, they might I'm with you. All they right, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about some specific viruses. Let's start with the small ones. Huh? Dick, how many different genome types are there? Seven. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Who named them? <laughs> <laughs> Why well, we're going to have him on as a guest on our show? That's I right, hope. David Baltimore. David Baltimore. So <laughs> these are the uh, single-stranded DNA viruses. Right. So there are some with just one strand. They're the, on the left here, the circoviridae. They have single-strand circles. And this is all we'll say about this today because we don't really understand how they replicate. But on the right, the parvoviruses. If you have a pet, 
you know, you should immunize them against various powerful viruses. They have single-stranded genomes. And at the top is just how these single-stranded genomes are expressed. Uh, they're made to first double-stranded because you can only make mRNA, which is the green molecule here, from a double-stranded template. Uh -huh. You need mRNA to make proteins. And remember, you can't replicate your genome unless you make at least one protein. And even these little parvoviruses, you're going to see, need to make at least one protein. Right. Now, the parvovirus genomes have this wonderful structure. It's single-stranded, but the ends can form these very unusual structures, which are basically partially double-stranded. Why can they do that? Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Look on the left here. We have a linear parvovirus DNA. The ends are inverted and complementary. What does that? Ah, uh, what is that called? What is it called? A palindrome. It's a palindrome. So look, look at the three prime end. A, B, C. A prime, which means it's complementary to A. Uh huh. And then D. And at the other hand, we have A prime, B prime, C prime. That's complementary to the other right. end. And then A and D prime. So the ends are complementary and inverted. It's not a palindrome, no. though. No, no, it just disappeared as a palindrome. Air I saw Ireland is a palindrome. That's right. If you right? lift out the A's and the D's, it would be. So these... No, it wouldn't even, it be, wouldn't that. even be that. But it is inverted it's complementary. It's a mirror image. It's a mirror image. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> these can form unusual structures. They can form these hairpins, shown on the right, hairpins. where the ends base pair, so you have this bottle-like structure. Sure. But the real relevant ones for us are the ones where the ends just form interesting T-like structures. These are the primers for DNA synthesis. Amazing. It folds back on itself to make a primer. I'll be done. So let's go up on the upper right. So it is, in fact, an, uh, if I'm not mistaken, an imperfect palindrome. Mm -hmm. Because you got A and A prime yeah, in right. both. Those are palindromic. Okay. And that's why you can fo form the hairpin. It's Thank imperfect you, because they're... <laughs> Interrupted by the B and C. That's right. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's good. We don't want to leave that hanging. <laughs> I'm not good at palindromes. <laughs> now, this serves as a primer. Go to the upper right here, Dixon. I'm going. You see, what was happened here is that the host DNA polymerase has used this hairpin at the left end of the genome, the three prime end, as a primer. Right. And has now made a new strand, which is in red. Okay. Got it. Okay, but... You're going to lose sequence if that's all you can do. So how does the virus get around this? Well, it makes a single protein that's involved in DNA replication. It's called Rep78-68, a really catchy name. How clever. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it's a great protein because what it does, it makes a nick right at the, at the bottom left. between the primer and the new strand? Or the old strand, basically. Oh, the, the, old, mix the old strand. Oh, the yeah. old strand. The, primer, okay. the new strand is in red. Makes a nick on the opposite got strand. Got it, got it, got it, got it. And then, I see what happens. Then now. a DNA polymerase will elongate from That's that That's amazing. Nick. So now it copies back the, the palindromic sequences or the, the what the, did we call them, the imperfect, imperfect palindrome. palindrome. So they're so, restored. So in making that nick, it, reveals a, it reveals a three prime end mm -hmm. right. that can now be used as a primer. Right. Ah. Notice all of this is getting around the, the, uh, the primer problem. That's right. You ever watch a guy make noodles? <laughs> sure. You know, he throws the noodles and he keeps throwing them up and he, and he pulls them apart and more noodles and more noodles. And the, you know, I That's think of that every here. time I think about DNA synthesis. Yeah. This is, solves the problem of the priming because otherwise, if you just took the molecule on the top, you would lose sequence from that. But this restores that left end. Amazing. So it extends um, from that three prime end. And now you go to the third molecule from the top here. That's the fourth step. You now have two complete molecules, DNA molecules. And if you look at the red, the red is the newly synthesized stuff. You can see the top, the red sure. goes to the right and a little bit to the left. Now these are all, the ends are all right. They look just like the ends of the DNA that started. So they can fold into these interesting structures. And away they go. And away they go. One of them is then copied again. So on, the, on step six, that red hairpin on the left is serving as a primer. The other strand is coming off. Amazing. And at the bottom, finally, you have a double-stranded product and a genomic DNA, cool. which is part blue and part red, and that could go into virions. The double-stranded molecule at the bottom could go right back to the top and start the whole replicative cycle again. 
And notice that is displacement synthesis. This is absolutely uh -huh. displacement synthesis right here. Yes, the top one is not. This is just filling in, I guess. Right, uh, Rich? The one yeah. start at the beginning. But this is displacement, right. right? And the strand that's displaced is the genome strand. So it's beautiful. It uses a hairpin as a primer. And then to make sure it doesn't lose sequence, it makes it has this protein that can nick that's the remarkable. product. Remarkable. Isn't that this amazing? Gets, this it gets is. called the rolling hairpin model of DNA replication. The rolling means. hairpin. That's nice because the hairpin is going down the genome as it's right. displaced. Yeah. So that's the only protein these viruses make. They use everything else from the cell in terms of DNA replication. Oh I think this and is in, in some ways, uh, you know, a lot of the times when the virus is providing a protein, it's some sort of a uh, specific recognition protein that recognizes this molecule as the one to do the replication on. And in some ways, uh, this is serving that purpose in that it's a, a nickase that specifically recognizes this molecule and makes it available for replication. What I don't know is whether the rep protein actually binds replication proteins and recruits them to this, mm -hmm. but I'll bet you it does. Yes, that could. I don't know the answer either. Very neat protein. All right. So to summarize, Dixon, because I know you like summaries. I do. The parvovirus is self-prime. They form a template primer. One protein that the virus makes, Rep 7868, is needed. The rest comes from the cell. Everything else comes from the cell. Now, look at this. Infection has no effect on cellular DNA synthesis. Of all the viruses we're going to talk about, this one has no effect. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, this is the uh, sensitivity to the replication state of the cell in the cases of uh, in the case of parvoviruses is exquisite. There are basically two <laughs> classes of parvoviruses, one called dependoviruses because they depend on another virus help helper, and another called autonomous parvoviruses. The autonomous parvoviruses can only replicate in dividing cells. They cannot replicate in cells that are quiescent. The dependoviruses, the ones that use a helper, get around this problem by using another virus to stimulate the cell replication. Uh, the most notorious of these is adeno-associated virus. Uh, and uh, adeno-associated virus is a parvovirus that infects cells preferentially when and replicates exclusively, really. Well, it can use other helpers, but uh, predominantly when they're infected with adenovirus. So the adenovirus stimulates the cell to uh, at least induce uh, DNA replication machinery, and that gives the uh, uh, parvovirus, the adeno-associated virus, an environment that's conducive for its own replication. Good these point. guys yeah. are... These guys are dead in the water without that sort of stimulation of the host. Right. So these guys, the ones that don't have adeno helpers, get into a non-dividing cell. It's end of the story. The end. Right. And so, for example, B19, the most uh, important human pathogen, uh, uh, preferentially affects uh, cells of the erythropoietic lineage. Okay? So these are rapidly dividing cells that make blood cells. See? It makes sense. It does make sense. It makes sense. It's beauty of biology. Some things you. make sense. Not everything, though. Let's <laughs> That's move because we don't know enough. Let's move into a little bigger virus. So now we have on this slide all the double-stranded DNA genomes that we'll talk about today. And these include the polyomaviruses, which are circular, double-stranded genomes, about five kilobase pairs. Then we have adenoviruses, which are linear double strands, 36 to 48 kilobases. Herpes, which are bigger, 120 to 220 linear double strands also. And the pox viral DNAs, 130 to 375. And what's left off of this particular slide are the um, papillomaviruses, which uh, were confused with the polyomaviruses for a long time. They're roughly the same size and also circular double-stranded DNA molecules. Right. And, of course, these being DNA, double-stranded DNA, they can be transcribed to mRNA directly. And they all need to make at least one protein to replicate their genomes. Now, except pox viruses, right, Rich? They, have, uh, well, they make a lot of proteins. They make a lot of proteins. They don't need anything from the host cell. All right. all right, let's see what happens here. Let's start with the polyomas. SV40, Merkel's carcinoma SD, virus. SV40. And these are the viruses that Rich did a postdoc on, right, Rich? Correct. So he loves these viruses. He loves all <laughs> this stuff. 
So they have a double-stranded circular genome, and we're just focusing in on the origin of replication. In the previous slide, you, you see there's one origin, one ORI, in the polyomavirus genome. That's where DNA replication begins. It starts at the ORI, and it goes in two ways, in two directions from the ORI. Hmm. So what you get is bidirectional replication, Neat. and it makes a replication fork. And in fact, it makes two. As this f replication moves away from the ORI, you get two forks. One ORI, two forks. Right. Now, this requires one viral protein, which has different names depending on the virus for SV40, which is probably the best characterized of all these viruses in terms of DNA replication. A lot of what we know was done using SV40. It's called T, big T or T antigen, or the, large T. The SV stands for simian virus, That's as I right. recall. That's right. So we isolated that from a primate somewhere? Actually, from cell culture. From cell cultures. It was, it was a contaminant of ah. uh, monkey cells that were being cultured. Got it. For use in making polio vaccine. <gasps> Maurice Hilleman. Oh, I knew him. Hmm. Did you? Yeah. Michael Katz worked with him. So, oh uh, yes, I met Michael at your birthday party. <laughs> what a connection. So we have a, a bidirectional replication fork. Starting from this ORI, you need T. Why do you need T? T has so many functions. It's amazing. This is one of the most amazing proteins I've ever encountered. I, I want to interject here yeah, on the, sure. the uh, <laughs> naming of this thing. Yeah. These viruses cause tumors in some uh, animals, and when people explored these tumors to try and figure out what the role of the virus was, they found a protein which was discovered immunologically, so it was called an antigen. Uh, and they right. were able to show that that antigen was encoded by the virus. And since it uh, caused, was associated with tumors, it was a tumor antigen, hence the name T antigen. Right. Okay? Got it. Okay. And it turns out that that's the single protein that's required to cause uh, tumors. Yep. Because of properties that Vincent is, I'm sure, going to tell us. We're going to talk about that uh, in very great detail at another time, but we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that here. So T binds to the origin in two sets of six, two, two hexamers of T. Here it's called LT for large T. Sometimes it's or Lawrence that. Taylor. Hey, I thought of the same thing too. <laughs> binds at the origin. You can see the two hexamers binding here, and this distorts the origin sequence, and it helps to unwind it. And a couple right. of cell proteins, you can see them here, called RPA and TOPO1. These come in and bind the DNA and start to unwind it's it. It's a TOPO isomerase. Exactly. I it unwinds it. And T is necessary for all this to happen. What's the difference between a TOPO isomerase and a helicase? Uh, helicase separates strands as it goes along. A topoisomerase takes a double-stranded molecule and can break one of the strands and unwind it and then reseal it. So, I so see. a topoisomerase relieves torsional strain in a molecule, right. whereas a helicase separates the strands. Here, here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is why you, one of the reasons why you need T to bind to the origin and get it opened up so you can start to have DNA sure. synthesis. Sure, that makes now, sense. in the next slide, we're going to have a look at a very interesting oh, experiment that was done a long time ago. Look at the molecules themselves. Yeah, these are electron micrographs of replicating DNA molecules. So what we, they did in this experiment, they infected cells with SV40, and then at different times, they extracted DNA and cut it with a restriction enzyme. That's RE here. So on the left is this circular viral genome with the origin, and they cut it with an enzyme that cut the DNA at one site only. And the reason they did that was so that they could see how replication occurred from the origin when they, when they linearized the molecule. Right. And then they look at these DNA. So on the bottom or at a different time points, they're looking at this in electron mic microscope. So on the left, you can see a very small bubble, which is the earliest... Uh, replication at the origin. So the replication forks haven't gone very far. And as you move to the right, the fork gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger right, and right, bigger. And right, you can right. see it's bidirectional by sure. this experiment. I'll bet you with an atomic force microscope, you could watch it happen. Really? You might be able to observe <clears throat> real-time replication. Mm, I don't think so. And no? I have to, the samples are, the samples are, it's, well, no, no, because... 
this would have to happen in a live cell. No, I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen. Or in a cell-free system. Couldn't you get this to work in a cell-free system? A lot of people have worked a lot. Yes, you can. A lot of people have worked a long time to get that to happen. Okay. And, and I believe it can be done now. Okay. Yep, it can be. So this tells you where the origin is. This was some of the early experiments. That, mm, we can measure exactly where it is. And depending on what enzyme you use to cut the DNA... You can get an idea of where it is. Did you so, do stuff like this, Rich? Uh, no, nah, I was the transcription guy. I see. Hmm. Okay. So blocking ORI would prevent cancer in some animals. Uh, yes, but um, this virus doesn't cause tumors in people. No, no, I said in some animals. In some animals, yes. could You could interfere with T antigen in some way. Okay. The T antigen is really the key. It pushes the cells to keep dividing, okay. and that's yeah. the initiation. Mm -hmm. of T the antigen is a multi multifunctional protein, Got and it. one of the things that it does is it binds cell regulatory factors that are <laughs> important for keeping the cells quiescent to deliberately, as we've already said, push the cells into uh, sure. a replication mode. Sure, so sure, sure. T antigen by itself, in the absence of these other DNA replication functions, will do that. Right. All right, I'm going to move to the next slide, which is... Uh, another view of the uh, you, you need to stop, Dixon? Um, I'm afraid I do. Um, not right now, but maybe in 10 more minutes. How's that? How about in, in about two hours? <laughs> I wish. All right, let's plan strategy Sorry, here. Let's plan strategy. Rich, what do you think? I mean, I don't have to be here for this. Well, you asked. Oh, yeah, questions. no, you, uh, uh, you're essential for this, Dick. Oh. This is my my former mother-in-law is in the hospital, and my son and oh. I are going to be going over there right now. So that's right. it's a kind of a touchy situation. I'm sorry to say. So, um, uh, can we make it through polyoma? Sure. Or, so or, what we do? We'll go through polyoma. You can leave, and then Rich and I will wrap up. All right. We'll do a couple of emails and some pics, and then, yeah. and then come back and do this another time. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So. How to connect the fragments it just shows a magnification of this bidirectional replication fork. Here's the origin, and now it's the bubble is quite large. And what I want to use this is to emphasize that there's uh, two different kinds of synthesis occurring. One on the what we call the leading strand, and that's on the left here. It's primed with an RNA primer, and the polymerase just shoots forward because it's making DNA in a five to three prime direction. It just has a straight shot. As, so, as long as this DNA can be denatured, it can keep synthesizing. But <clears throat> on the other side of the origin, uh, it can't keep doing this. It has to make primers because the bubble begins here. It, ha it makes a first primer and then makes a first piece of DNA. Then as the bubble gets bigger, it makes another piece and then another piece. So it can't mm. do a straight shot of synthesis because right. it has to wait for this area to be denatured. On the other strand, the leading... Synthesis can happen as a straight shot just below, but again on the left, lower left, it has to be what's called lagging, which means it depends on the bubble opening up and making single-stranded templates. And they, these are the RNA primers that Rich talked about earlier. Eventually, these have to be removed. The gaps are filled in. Now, this is what's interesting here. The As we get farther and farther away from the origin... We're not sure if the enzyme is moving out there or if the DNA is passing actually through a stationary mm. complex of some sort. This is uh -huh. one of the things that needs to be worked out. All right, so this is what's happening at this bubble around the SV40 origin, and eventually it goes all the way around, and you get two molecules made. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide because this just shows you the whole process, starting from T antigen binding to melting and all the enzymes coming in, adding, making primers, uh, making leading and then lagging strands. The leading strands have to get made to denature the bubble. The lagging strands come next. You then remove the primers, fill in the gaps, and seal the molecules. And this happens as this thing expands. So just in general, do you know how much actual real time it takes to make a single replication of its genome? I believe it's known. Do you know the answer to that? Uh, I do not know the answer. I'm sure it's known. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I don't know yeah. the answer to yeah. that. Yeah, you might be surprised at the time. Um, I wish I could tell you. It's probably in the textbook. It's seconds, minutes, no, hours? No, not seconds. I'm sure Well, my guess minutes. is we're talking about a, a, rep, a polymerization rate that's on the order of, I don't know, at least 100 nucleotides per second, maybe more. Okay. And you're talking about a 5 KB genome, so do the math. Right. Um, right. Uh, a couple of minutes, not long. No. All right. Well, then, in the end, Dixon, 
Yes. Here in this slide called resolution, mm -hmm. we have we start with a covalently closed circular double-stranded template. As we're replicating it, it gets all twisted up. This looks like a magician's trick. It's twisted into yes, knots. Absolutely. You know, like the, the two rings that they put yes, together. Yeah, and stuff? It is. Absolutely. <laughs> it gets twisted up. And eventually this twisting, distortion, or overwoundedness would stop DNA synthesis cold. And so that's where these topoisomerases come in. As Rich said, right. they cleave one of the strands and release the tension. Like rubber bands. You're exactly. Twisting, then you're... So then you have relaxed Amazing. super coils. It's a, you know... So topo one and two are really important for this. Otherwise, wouldn't happen. So and, uh, let, me, let me remind you that uh, my five prime end problem, okay, that you can't <laughs> completely replicate the ends of a linear DNA molecule. One solution, don't have any ends. Right. right. It's a circular molecule. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Thank you. No ends. <laughs> Circles right. don't have an end problem. They do not. That's why circular genomes evolved. One reason. Amazing. Because somebody goofed a long time ago. <laughs> How are we going to fix this? Let's make a circle. That's right. We did it. <laughs> now, when you finish making two molecules, that's on the bottom. Now you have, they're all linked together. See, they're all intertwisted. They may be relaxed, but they're still all intertwined. And that, where topo again, topo two in this case, separates them. It cleaves them in on two circles. Like, you know, take your... Yeah, Thumb yeah. and forefinger sure, and link sure. them. You sure. cleave one, you got them released. So that's why these topo ones Amazing. and twos are so cool. Now I'm almost done, Dixon. I'm not, you know, chafing at the bit here, but I do have. Well, a time you're limit. you're walking out the door. I am not. Okay. Yet. Okay. Is that okay <laughs> for topo one and two, Rich? Yeah. Next one. All right. So this T protein, this T antigen or large T, Lawrence Taylor. This is not only important for binding the origin and getting DNA replication started. But as we mentioned, it also binds and sequesters the regulators of the cell cycle. And that kicks the cells into the S phase where DNA synthesis occurs. Why? Because the virus needs the apparatus, as we've said. So T antigen kicks it into S phase. If the virus infects a non-dividing cell, by gosh, it's going to be dividing before you know it. Right. As soon as T antigen is made. Now, this is the only group of viruses that has a T antigen, right? The other viruses have other proteins that do, similar, do similar things. things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to show the cell cycle because we keep talking about yeah, this. Absolutely. The cells divide roughly 24 hours per division. They go through a number of phases. Um, they go through a growth phase where the control of the cycle is, is regulated. That's the restriction point. They go into S phase then where DNA is replicated. G2 is where the division is preparing. And then finally, M is mitosis, which is shown at the top. That's when you actually get the one cell breaking into two and the chromosomes partitioning. So all the DNA synthesis that has occurred during S allows for two copies of the chromosomes. T antigen kicks the cell into S. If it's in G1, if it's resting, if it's restricted from going forward, T antigen, bam. You sound like the chef, huh? Bam, what's that guy's name? <laughs> Emeril Lagasse. Emeril Lagasse. What happens if you threw some colchicine in the mix? Uh, that just keeps them from actually separating, right? It still yes. make DNA. Yeah, it depolarizes the microtubules. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting actually to know what effect that would have, say, on a virus like this. I'll bet you it, it would be okay. Mm. Okay, because you're mm -hmm. still stimulating the cells to make DNA. Exactly. They just can't actually do the division. Can't divide. That's right. That's just a guess. Uh huh. Because they get stuck in. Um, oh, I forget. I, I think they get stuck in the uh, the part where the chromosomes are about to come apart, but they can't come apart because there's no. Yeah, they mess up the spindle. There's or no something. spindle to to, yeah. to go on. So this is important because other viruses are going to do this, and you can see that if right. you make the cells divide continuously, eventually they accumulate mutations mm -hmm. and they become transformed and develop into tumors. And we'll talk about that more, but this is the basis for that, Right. part of the basis for right. that. All right, Dixon, we can stop there so that you may depart. I am sorry that I must leave. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We, We're going to do... We've been going for a while. You said an yeah. hour, and you've been going a little bit more, but... Yeah. No problem. Good. We covered some basics first. We're going to return. We'll do part two of DNA synthesis. I, I'm fascinated by No, no, no it's okay. Really? You can go, and uh, Rich and I will do some email and pics and wrap it up. Cool. Okay? Yep. Go visit 
uh, your stirpes, no, not stirpes, <laughs> your relations. and uh, Yeah, well, there are obligations that we all must do. Uh, Dixon is at verticalfarm.org, medicalecology.com, and wait. The other way. <laughs> Trichinella.org, medicalecology.com, verticalfarm.com. Excellent. All right. Good to see you. Thank you for coming and sitting on this. It's my pleasure. Hi, Dixon. This okay. Fun. Thanks, Rich. Yep. See it's you. always a pleasure to play the, play the dummy in front of us. You're not a dummy. You ask great dummy, questions. Dixon. You ask great questions. <laughs> they are all fantastic. How about a yep. novice? A novice is a better term than. But you're a scientist. Uh, actually, I had a, I had a compliment from uh, on this format from a, a friend of mine today who uh. specifically pointed out that um, you really helped the whole thing because you really helped pace it. Okay. You know, by asking the questions, all the questions everybody else is asking. Fair enough. Uh, and they're all good questions, so it's good. Okay. Bye, Dixon. Very good. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Enjoy. Enjoy your vacation. Thank you. All right. I'm going to cancel the slides. There's Rich again. Yep. Goodbye, Rich. Bye, Dixon. I'm going to shut those down and get to our emails. Don't. Ooh, can I see you now? Oh no, I can't. Don't I, I can try. Don't forget your, your telephone, Dixon. All right. Goodbye. Uh can I, mean, you I don't see me? have to be able to see you, but it would be fun as long as what's, we're hooked up video. What's that, Dixon? I'll be back in September. Bye bye. See you <laughs> in, September. in September. Let's see, what can I do here? Um I could um no, see, so if I stop recording, then um, we don't see you. Okay, f you know, forget it. Just keep going. All right, let's do some email. All right. First, actually, uh, we probably get uh, the second one is long. <laughs> first one's long. They're both long. Yeah, should we? Uh, well, let's read the first one. Yeah. Because this is actually um, a good one. This is from Connor. He writes, my name is Connor, and I'm an undergraduate, soon-to-graduate microbiology student at Oregon State University. I've recently discovered your show, and I love listening to it, especially now that it's featured on Stitcher, making it much easier for me to listen when I'm walking around campus or taking a road trip. I'm taking an immunology course this term, and I wanted to discuss the article you brought up about HIV and HLA Class 1, which I'll call MHC1, from here on so as not to confuse myself. You expressed some confusion, and I thought I'd try to explain it. Try is the key word here since I am only a student on this, and I'm actively trying to figure this out as I'm writing. You remember that episode, uh, Rich? Was... I, I do. Uh, matter of fact, I'm still confused. And uh, But this kid actually has it all under control, and I see a professor in the makings here. This is a good explanation, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's very this good. very good. All right, so he says, MHC class 1 molecules present peptides from a cell's cytosol on its surface. T cells can then bind these molecules. If the peptide bound to MHC is recognized as self by the T cell receptor, the T cell will receive a negative signal and leave the cell alone. When recognized as pathogenic, the T cell will get a positive signal that will tell it to kill the MHC presenting cell. This is pretty basic, and I'm guessing you already know this, but I thought I would give some background. Absolutely. I need it every time. Now the problem with this is preventing T cells from recognizing self peptides. The thymus is very important for this. Cells in the epithelium of the thymus express MHC1 and 2, and using what is known as the AIRE transcription factor, tissue-specific peptides found all over the body can be expressed by these thymic epithelial cells and presented on their MHCs. Positive and negative selections occur to get rid of non-functional and self-reactive T cells. Now here is where the paper comes in. Since there is so much allelic diversity from MHCs, they can vastly differ between individuals. Here the paper mentions HLA B57 specifically. They say this MHC can bind far fewer peptides in the human proteome than others. This should cause thymic epithelial cells to present fewer self-peptides to T-cells and decrease negative selection. As a result, the diversity of T-cells would increase and they would be able to recognize a greater variety of peptides as foreign. However, I believe this would increase risk of self-recognition and ultimately autoimmunity. My guess is that as HIV mutates, it may begin to express sections of peptide that may be similar to some of those found in the human proteome. 
So in most cases, a regular diversity of T cells will recognize these peptides as self, and no or little response will be elicited. But in the case of thymic cells expressing HLA-B57, less negative selection occurs in the thymus, a greater variety of T cells persist in the body, and your immune system has a greater chance to recognize HIV as a pathogen even after mutation. This is purely speculation, but I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about this. I hope it's, I explained it well and correctly. My immunology professor would be disappointed if I didn't. If I confused you, I apologize. You guys do an awesome job, and I look forward to each new episode. Thanks again. I can't find anything wrong with that. No, I think it it's looks a great right explanation. To me. And yeah. I think that the uh, speculation that there would be autoimmunity problems is interesting there. I don't know, I don't know if there's any data on that. Do you? I don't know, but I know that that's that would be an uh, obvious consequence of having the self uh, reactivity and right. you know the the broader uh, responsiveness. So yeah, you have to balance that. I, I suppose there is evidence. I just don't know it. So if he goes to his professor with this, I want him to write us back again and see what his professor said. Yeah, you uh, should do that. Because it uh, it sounds good to me. I, 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 I it's a very nice explanation. Like I said, I see a. Uh, a teacher or a professor in the, in the making here. And by the way, that's TWIV82, Immunology in Silico, where we talked about this, if you want to go back and check it out. All right, the next one is from Sergio. Actually, two different parts here, very interesting. Sergio is from, uh, at the moment, he's in Japan. This is the second time I write, and the previous was like two years ago. Wow, we're that old. I had stumbled on TWIV searching for microbiology-related podcasts for my then-brand-new iPod. Now the iPod is pretty worn out, and TWIV is one of my favorites. <laughs> I never miss one. I am a plant pathologist, microbial ecologist, about to finish my Ph.D. work in bacterial plant pathogens, but I am so into molecular biology that plant virology is very attractive, and probably I will do some plant virology in the future. Now that all of you have been showing interest in RNA interference and related topics, I thought this would be the perfect moment to ask you something that has been around my head for some time. A few years ago, in my plant virology class, my professor explained his research on new plant varieties resistant to viral infections. There are two main approaches, infection of plants by mild virus strains to generate what is known as cross-protection, something like a vaccine for plants without the immune system, and transgenic plants were a viral gene, set of genes, is inserted into the plants. Then he started to explain the rationale and the theoretical basis of these two methods and their relationship to gene silencing or RNAi. That's where he lost me. I've been going around this in my little free time, and I kind of get the cross-protection stuff, but the transgenic stuff is beyond me. Needless to say, I don't get the relationship to RNAi. I know you are specialized in animal viruses, but you are my best source of info on viruses, so I thought I would give it a try. All right, let's stop there. So I asked a former student of mine, Eric Moss, who works on RNA silencing. Good. I'm glad you asked somebody. <laughs> and he said— I have, a, I have a slippery grip on this. Well, you know, Rich— one thing I do know, if I don't know the answer, I know where to look for it. That's right. Go ask somebody. That's the trick. This is one way post-transcriptional gene silencing was first observed. People were trying to make more intense colors of petunias using transgenes encoding pigment enzymes. What they wound up with instead were flowers with white sectors, where not only wasn't the extra pigment made, but the endogenous gene was silenced. So the same principle applies to viruses. Make a transgene expressing some, but not all, virus genes. If the plant gets infected, there are already preloaded risk complexes with siRNAs ready to cleave the virus's RNA. The phenomenon of transgene-induced virus resistance was known before the discovery of RNA interference, but the mechanism wasn't known. What happens is that multi-copy transgenes produce a sufficient amount of double-stranded RNA to engage the RNAi machinery. Plants and some other creatures have the ability to replicate double-stranded RNA via RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Mammals don't seem to have these RNA polymerases except whatever copies hepatitis delta RNA. RNAs homologous to virus sequences can be maintained and transported from cell to cell, I think, and act as siRNAs, thus conferring resistance. So he gave us a couple of nice links to a review of the field, a picture of a transgenic petunia, 
And uh, so basically, you put a transgene in, you can confer resistance. And also, um, if you infect a plant with a virus, the same thing happens. The plant makes uh, RNAIs, interfering RNAs, from the viral genome, uh, and it protects the plant. And Eric writes, I guess that's what people mean by immunity in plants. The technical term used in the literature is cross-protection, which refers to a phenomenon that is entirely RNAi-based. The persistence of the protection is due to the propagation of virus-specific RNAs by polymerases. Right. So once you've established a little bit of double-stranded RNA for a given gene and um, uh, trigger the RNA I machinery, that double-stranded DNA is basically propagated and actually systemically spread through the plant right. uh, and can then go through the whole RNA silencing thing. So once the, once the gene is there, that, uh, it, once the transcripts are there, that gene can be silenced uh, in the future. Right. Rich, can you handle the second half? Sure. Now that I am about to go back home and hopefully work as a researcher in a university, I also thought you could give me some advice on getting funded. Oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to give him advice on getting funded? <laughs> you see, I'm from Bolivia, and public universities there are completely free, as in beer, so there is no money for research. Most of the budget goes into infrastructure and salaries, so serious researchers must get their funds mostly from foreign cooperating agencies or multinational organizations. I thought this was because we were a developing country and being so poor, simply there was no money for research. But I learned that the situation is not so different in the U.S. Researchers have to compete very hard to get funded, and if they don't, well, it's over. Since in Bolivia, the money comes from cooperation, there is a natural skew towards applied research and mostly oriented to development. But I believe, and I hope I'm not being naive, that if you get funded and get some materials and equipment for applied research, some basic research, quote, made in the developing world and for the developing world, unquote, is possible. What do you think? Do you think it is better to stay in the applied field solving the many problems we have in the developing world, or is it a good idea to try to perform basic research and add new knowledge for the sake of science from the developing, uh, for, the developing, for the developing world? Would a paper be published even if it was from a small Bolivian university? Uh, and if you were from a cooperating agency... What would I have to write to convince you to fund some research? By the way, I forgot to mention that while I'm studying in Japan, uh, that I'm studying in Japan, where as soon as you get a scholarship, the research is automatically funded by the Japanese government, and each lab has a budget directed to research that seems enough to at least fund the student's research. Uh, I know that my questions are too detailed and probably out of the scope of TWIV. No and no. But, hey, better safe than sorry. Uh, once again, thanks for TWIV and TWIP. Hopefully very soon for TWIB. I guess that this week in beer? That's right. Recent, uh, sincerely, Sergio. Well, my uh, idea on this is that the best science ought to be funded, whether it's basic or translational. And that you ought to try and do the, be the best science, whether it's basic or translational. Some people like doing translational research, and some people prefer to do basic research. There is a lot of pressure because it is um, taxpayers' dollars. Uh, and in our situation, uh, handled by the National Institutes of Health, there's a certain expectation on behalf of the taxpayers, and I don't blame them, that the money will go ultimately to... Um, uh, improve human health uh, in in the country. Uh, but what we need to understand is that a lot of the improvements in human health come from very basic research that is not obviously translational in the begin in the beginning. My experience is that despite all of the noise about translational research, there persists an understanding in the system uh, that basic research is important. And in fact, as I've said before, I think that those of us who serve on study sections have a responsibility uh, for perpetuating that paradigm, for funding uh, uh, or for encouraging we can't use the word funding when we're on study sections for encouraging uh, basic research. So uh, my bottom line is do what you're interested in, whether it's basic or translational, and just do it well. And if it's good science, it'll get funded and it'll get published. Sure, we'll publish. We'll, uh, I'm not on the... 
I'm not one of the uh, big shots at the Journal of Virology, but uh, if you're in Bolivia and you submit uh, a really good paper to Journal of Virology, we don't care where you're from, as long as the science is good. Yeah, Amen. I, was, I think uh, I also want to point out that here in the U.S., the tuition, well, you said they're free Public universities in Bolivia are free, so there's no money for research. But here, uh, universities are not free, but that money doesn't go to research anyway. It comes from other sources. Uh, so that's the problem. If you don't have a good source of that money locally, it will be hard to do any kind of research. There right. are agencies that will fund international research, as, as you mentioned. Uh, the, the real problem is getting an infrastructure built. If you don't have it, then anything you do is not likely to be productive. If you don't have the right facilities to do research, then any money you put into doing that is not really uh, is not really effective or efficient. So, and that can differ in country to country. I don't know what it's like in Bolivia, but you know the, you can make the argument that there are many countries in the world where you should, if if money is scarce, you should put it towards helping people, towards feeding them and and giving them medical care. Yeah. Uh, rather than doing research. So that is a decision that has to be made. And then at one point, if if the country uh, moves forward, and as many countries have done, for example, Mexico now has a very good research establishment. They, they didn't always have that because they had to spend money on other things. But they're doing very well. I have many colleagues down there, uh, and they have money for it. So it's not something that will get solved overnight. Uh, and it may be that you are better served working somewhere else rather than your own country. Maybe you can return someday and, and try to do something. But um, as Rich said, do what you're interested in and don't give up. Those are my thoughts, yep, Sergio. I agree. So we can answer any questions. We can try. It's not outside our scope, right? <laughs> I think we should move down to our picks, Rich. Sure. And wrap this one up. What have you got for us today? Uh, I have another uh, feed from my wife who uh, reads the New York Times online and the local paper religiously, and she came across a New York Times article uh, titled, Breast Milk Sugars Give Infants a Protective Coat. And I've got a link to that and a link to the PNAS article, which is a sort of a conference summary uh, that this came from. And let me see if I can um, resurrect this. What this is about, it turns out that breast milk contains a whole bunch of uh, complex sugars that uh, humans cannot digest. Uh, and so the question arises, and a lot of this paper is about uh, determining what sugars those are. So the question is, why is this? It turns out that the infant's microbiome, the infant's gut flora, includes uh, bacteria that specifically utilize these complex sugars uh, as a carbon source and uh, digest them. So the fact that these um, sugars are in the breast milk encourages these particular bacteria to flourish in the uh, infant's gut. And it turns out the theory, at least, is that those bacteria in the infant's gut are protective against invasion by other bacteria in the gut that may be harmful or not so good for the infant. So I just thought that was terrific. It's another That's one great. of these sort of symbiosis things that we've been talking about. And it's one of many that we're going to hear in the yeah. next years. Yeah, this yeah. is great. I've heard a couple of others that are, have yet to be published, and they're Along the same lines. Yeah, this is great. Does your wife know that she's giving us a uh, pick? Uh, yes, I tell, her when she, I tell her when she comes up with these feeds. I told her this morning. Enough. And I think she's gotten to the point where when she sees something, she <laughs> deliberately feeds it to me because she knows I'm hungry for picks. Yeah. You know? So here we are. Yeah, that's a good one. I like great. that article. Well, my pick today is a book. It is called... The Great American University, Its Rise to Preeminence, Its Indispensable National Role, Why It Must Be Protected. And it's by Jonathan Cole, who I know he used to be the provost here at Columbia. He has since stepped down and is a professor 
And this was the product of his being a professor again since he stepped down in the last few years. He wrote this book. It's basically a history of the research universities in the U.S. And I really wanted to read this because I'm at a research university, and there are a lot of things about this that I don't understand. I don't understand how it got started, uh, where it's headed, uh, how it's supported, and that's all of that he covers and more in this book. That sounds very interesting. I, I'd be interested in that. I think anyone who works at a university should read it. And right. if you don't and you just want to know why we exist, um, you should read this. It's a very long book. And in fact, this is one of the first books I bought for my iPad. I'm reading it on my iPad. <laughs> and um, it's great. And it's not too hard to read, but it has a lot of insight about what makes universities, big universities, research universities, uh, what makes them tick and why they are here. I really like it, and uh, I highly recommend it. Excellent. Check it out. Jonathan Cole's a good guy, too. And, of course, Dixon's not here, so he can't give us a pick of the week. That should do it for another Virology 101, and we'll come back as soon as we can and finish that up. We have at least one more for DNA synthesis. Don't I don't think? think teaching has ever been so much fun. Oh, it's great. First you of know, all, you write the lecture. That's good. <laughs> Second, we don't have to write or give or grade an exam. That's great. That's right. You know, this is wonderful. I took that lecture from my course, basically. I just uh -huh. uh, changed it a bit. I actually don't give that lecture. Sol Silverstein, my colleague, does. But uh, I heard him oh, give this it. Is, this is great fun. Yes, uh, Virology 101 is great. And as always, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. If there's something we didn't explain, ask us. Uh, you can find twiv at iTunes. The Zoom Marketplace. You can listen to it on your Stitcher on your on your smartphone with Stitcher Radio, a free app, or you can go to twiv.tv, listen there, or download the episodes. We have them all archived, as well as all the show notes, the letters we read, and the picks of the week. We're also part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com. I really like the video, Rich. You'll see when I put it up that. It's a lot of fun, and I think we're going to have to work towards doing this as an essential part of TWIV and even doing it live. Oh, I think so, too. I think it'd be great. Because you can't see me, but I see you here, and as you're talking, it just adds another dimension. Well, one of the things I have to learn is to spend more time looking right at the camera. That's right. You know, uh, But that, that, that'll that be a trick. I'll, I'm, I've got it on my mind. I'll figure get it out. It. No, I, my camera is off to the side, so I'm not even looking at it. Hey, camera. But... Um, I love this the video. The audio is great for people who can't look, but I think there are a lot of individuals who. Yeah, would love see if to you see uh, work on setting us up so I can see you guys while this is happening. I that will. Would, that would I will. Kick. Yeah, that, that's not a problem. I just didn't have time to do it today. Rich, thanks for joining us. Rich is at the University of Florida Gainesville, home of the Fighting Gators. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, you know, this has become a, an important part of my life. I love it. Great. Good it's to have fun. you always. You've been listening to this week in virology. Oh, i got to start over. By the way, we will be taking a short break on TWIV. I'm not sure if it'll be a week or two weeks. This, When you hear this episode, it may be a week or two gap, but then we will be back. So no more than two weeks without TWIV. You can go back and listen to some old ones. Why? Because Vincent is going to take a vacation. Have a wonderful vacation, Vincent. It sounds like a, a good time. You're traveling down the West Coast, right? Traveling down the West Coast, and uh, I might run into some virologists and record a conversation with them if I can, in which case I'll, I'll post it. If not, we'll, we'll be back on the September, the Friday after Labor Day. I don't know what the date is on that. Probably the 10th, I think, 10th, 10th I think of September, that, something like that. I think we are all yes. here. You're you're on the schedule, I believe. I yep. think Alan is. I don't know about Dixon. If he's around, we'll do it then. So that'll be the latest that you might get another TWIV, but uh, perhaps even earlier. Let's, uh, let's get Dixon back and finish this Virology 101 before it goes cold on us. Yeah, we'll do that right away as well. We could do that any time during the week. All sure. right. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.